Hello, look at here. Hey, I'm, I hit my chat button. Hey, I'm kind of learning this stuff just a little bit now. Don't mess with me. And I want to greet you this morning. Listen, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. I'm excited. Hey, look, jump over to John 13 for me for a minute. I want to talk with you about some things. Hey, listen, I'm dealing with the general topic, though, of consecration. However, the, I am applying it to these different uh, kinds of historical things that I've done in the background as a result of my giving myself over to God. And so I want to talk with you about also what I call the missing sacrament of the church. Now, that sounds kind of religious, doesn't it? But I'm saying, um, yes, what do I mean by that? I mean, you have the sacrament of baptism by water, then you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You may not have been told that's a sacrament, actually. Why? Because for that requires thirst. If any man thirsts, that is like, you got to go after it in order to be better. You know, I mean, we try to throw that on people like the Holy Ghost will just jump on you, you know, whatever. No, you got to give yourself toward that. And then you have Communion, which is like another sacrament. It, often as you do this, Jesus talked about that. I might look at some of those things with you for a second. But these are the deepening elements of your life that are critical. And then the sacrament of foot washing. Now, let's go back to yesterday. Yesterday, I showed you a video and talked to you about conflict resolution. And what I did for nine straight years and going away in 40 days and praying and fasting. And I had, I had bombarded the heavenlies for reconciliation between blacks and whites. I said that those nine years that I consecrated myself, fasting, seeking God, losing weight, prepared me to be able to stand before 70,000 men and tell them what the Bible says about his creation and the church, we were one. And that's true. God affirmed it. Now, here we are now, 30 years after I did that, still having conflict resolution. Do you know Coach Bill McCartney, the founder of Promise Keepers? You know, let's face it, his daughter fell in love with one of his football players, a coach, and he has a kid that's, you know, you know, multicultural kid, you know, but you know what? He didn't let that impact his heart for reconciliation. I and mean, he had a heart for it. And I was the one evidently God chose to be able to hit it like that without having a chip on the shoulder. As a matter of fact, I was on the James Dobson's show focused on the family. But the reason that they asked me, now this is kind of a lot, is because they said that Coach and Dobson said, we need somebody who's black, actually, to talk about reconciliation that doesn't seem to be mad at white people. My case, even though I was younger, I wasn't mad at them. I was disappointed in them. 2,000 years after the resurrection of Jesus, we still don't know that race is sovereign. You get that? That means that God decides what race everybody is going to be. And it's nothing for a person to brag about, nor is it for a person to be retrograded about. You understand what I'm saying? Look, I jumped into it right away with you, but I'm just saying, I was just giving Derek Prince, one of my favorite historical teachers. He says, every good teacher does it by way of recapitulation. A big word again, isn't it? Yeah, that's what he did. That's what he says. He's, he's like Oxford you know, Englishman. But let me go back one more time. So yesterday, so I showed you that. Then, then the first day I said, look, Adam failed his family. And I said, I wanted to dedicate myself to God. I, I, I was conceived out of wedlock. I never, I didn't meet my dad till I was 35. What I learned about being a husband and a dad, I learned from the Bible. So I consecrated myself to that. And then I showed you the video where my wife ranked me. I, I asked her to come up. And this time we were in Chicago before like 
mm, 80,000 men. I let them come up. Nobody had ever done that. Let their wives come up in a men's meeting. Just kind of like I am on stuff, you know? But I was, God leads me to do things like that. And the timing of it seems to be amazing. I, I don't care. Nothing to brag about. It's just the overemphasis of the truth. And I let you, I let you in on that. That's it's been the case. So consecration applied to your personal devotion as a man or wife. I quoted to you the scripture about the structure of that first day of a husband to the wife, a wife to the husband, children to their family. And I said, your family is exactly the same as Adam's family. Well, oh, I jumped already. Father, help us now this morning. The spirit of revelation evidently is something that you want to get to the hearts of the people. These people have good ground. Here we are now, Thursday. These people are hungry. They're, they're good people. And they're blessed people. And give them the truth. And thank you for letting the Holy Spirit give them what they should know. Open their eyes to see open their ears to hear, and we'll glorify and bless you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's go back to that point we were making now, just, just again now. This is going to measure the way I'm going to say this. Adam's family is a family that populated the whole earth. Now, and we're all kin folks. I have said that to you and to cities more than I can count. You know? I'm, I'm looking at a scripture right now. D did you hear that? We're all kin folks. I'm telling you, not just because uh, one person may be of one race. And it says it in, in Acts 17, 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell upon the face of the earth. You hear that? And has determined their uh, pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Do you know what is, what's there? In the three major points right there in that verse that's critical of one blood. Who's the one blood? That's Adam's blood he's talking about. So God let one man and his blood and his family populate the whole earth, okay? So you may not think of it this way, but you came, you're, you're, you're the project of Adam and you came from his house. Now, did you decide to come into the world? Every one of you listening to me now, did you decide to come into the world on your own? Nope. Did you decide to have the parents that you have? Nope. Did you decide what nation you would be or country, right? Nope. I meaning what nationality? Nope. Did you decide what gender? Nope. That was a sovereign. So God brought you into the world. Now, so let's say then in this case, let's just go back to you now and where you are now. Let's say you're an adult. So you got married and you believe that God, like this is the woman, he's the man. Now you have children. God allowed for conception. You know why? Because there are people who are married and can't have children. And I don't believe it's possible. Can't have them. I believe they should have them, but there's something that has to be broken. But here's the point. Father, in Jesus' name, uh, two things, God, I want you to break the spirit of the thinking of impossibility when all power lies in your hands. Jesus, as the son of man said, all authority has been given to him. He represents us. So now, Lord, if there's somebody here who's saying, we'd love to have children, and they have, like, there's no way physically it can happen. Lord, thank you for telling the devil to shut up. You created the body, you can recreate it. You are the almighty God. The devil is a liar. Their faith is the is the is the thing that changes it all. Not just the doctrine of faith, but the fact that they know your love is greater than your challenges, than our challenges. So God, now give them children. I, you know, I've prayed for so many people that uh, couldn't have children and within a year they were calling me up. Well, I discovered it maybe a year or two later, they didn't call me up. But God, it happened. We glorify you and bless you now in Jesus' name. And then secondly, I want you to give them the ability to believe for you to also that their family is so great, that their character is so wonderful. They could take children that somebody else has had, but they raise them up in the character principles and standards that you gave them. 
help them to be open to adopt. In Jesus' name. Okay, now there you go. So that's for somebody right there. So look, don't pass it by. You are on the resource side. I was thinking this morning when I first got up that you are you are so great. You're on the resource side. And God brought you into this world. So the same way God said, let us make Adam, God allowed your parents to be pregnant and you came into the world by the choice of God. So now let's go to where I was when I divvied off into this conversation. If God took your family out and put it on a planet and said, you be fruitful, multiply, replenish that planet, what would it look like? Based on the faithfulness of the husband, the submission of the wife, the obedience of the children. And let's say you got staff, okay? I mean, all right? What would it look like? What did that? What would that planet look like? Let me just say to you this: What do you think if 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 marriage and family is not a permanent construct? You know what I mean. Meaning that you're going to die, right? I mean, husband dies, wife dies, children grow grow up, they die, they die. So what is it for? If it's not permanent, your whole life is to be multiplied. See, like in in in, in uh, Genesis one twenty eight, when he says, "Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it," he, he's talking about everything. This is the perfect man he's talking to. So, what about his life? God couldn't promote. See, the devil came to invalidate the call of God on Adam's life. So that instead of him being promoted out of the garden, he was demoted out of it. Do you understand? But there's no ceiling to where God can take you if you're in alignment with him. Why? Because it would be the same as him being there. So that's why husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your own husband. You're doing it as unto the Lord, both of you. So that says that anywhere God places you, it would be exactly the same as God being there. I'm not talking about like almighty God. You are the child of God. Like genetically, whatever your parents' DNA, X or Y chromosomes are, you are that, whether you like it or not, physically, biologically. Spiritually, it's exactly the same. But the devil has fooled the church to make you think, come on, you're not that. Hey, I've I never done this. I'm waking up here now. Hey, Grace, Rainey over here. You getting this, Rachel? I see you over here. I, I'm, call, I'm calling some people out here this morning. Yes. See, I got a little thing over here. I don't usually do it, but I did it. Jan over here. So we, you are amazing. So the, the goal of the devil is to make you not understand the pathway to your amazement. Uh -uh, I'm screaming at you. I'm not talking about what you can achieve. That what you can achieve on the earth won't even go with you. It's what you become on the earth is what you take with you. That's promotable. I read a dynamite scripture to you yesterday. So now look, so today I got to go through another pathway. So you're a one blood. Now, let me bottom line it out about the family. You think that God is not judging you for your faithfulness? So that in the next world, something that you've grown to allows God to give you a responsibility in the eternal dimension. That's the reward. You can't think of anything in the earth that is worth something to God, but you, the wicked dead, the devil, the fallen, the fallen angels, demons, all those, they're going for the lick of fire. The earth itself is going to be purified by fire. You're going to be then rewarded in something called the judgment seat of Christ. And the Father only knows what he's going, where he's going to place you. In my Father's house are many mansions, you see, placement. But you're growing to it now. So don't get stuck up or caught up with this life and the stuff that you don't have, do have, what people call you, say against you, you know, what gender you are, 
You know, they'll get caught up in it. Be Christ-like. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you on a big one now in a minute because it's important. It's important. And that's why. So again, I want to thank all of you for coming on here. Like, you're a blessing. Uh, this is the first time I looked around. I see like, there's like a bunch of you on here now. Thank you for being hungry. I, I love it. I, I just love it. And you're the people he's going to use over there. And uh, right now, you're you're shaking up the city you're in. And God is, a, is being, is a, he's blessed you. Look, don't be on the sidelines. You know, get in there and do all that you can for the sake of God. And then spend all the time you can. You got to make it though. It's like, like the guys, you know, spend time doing the stuff they do. I like golf. I mean, I haven't played it in a minute. And, um, but mm -mm, that that's gonna take the place of this. Mm -mm, I love I love this. I love you, and I love putting the truth out. So look, so John chapter thirteen. So that's recapitulation. Okay, you can't say it again. Maybe you might get. Um, uh, recapitulation tomorrow, John 13. So that's the missing sacrament. Now, of the church, why? Because it's very seldom done. The ultra Pentecostals are the ones that, that are thought about that does this. What are we talking about here? And you got it right, foot washing, foot washing. Look, baptism is your surrender to God. You see? Communion is your ongoing relationship with God. Foot washing is your ongoing relationship with one another. In each of those sacraments, you're, you're, there's a measure of consecration that makes you promotable. Did you hear what I said? And in the kingdom of God, he wants to promote you. See? Um, now, here, Jesus was washing his disciples' feet. Can you imagine Jesus going low enough to wash the disciples' feet who he created? You said it was John 1, right? In the beginning was the word, see? All things were made by him. Come on. I'm going to wash. The How are you going to go that low? Because he did this as an example for him. That's what it says here. You have it? And uh, I can't read the whole chapter because I want to show you something. And Peter was like, he couldn't handle it. He's almost undone because of it. It's John 13. Hey, by the way, I do have a book on it called The Low Road to New Heights. Yep, I did it. It was published by Doubleday. It's, it's you know, like just with you, most of the culture back then, I, you know, I'm up there, I'm out there. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. You know, it's, you, you got to be old. I should have probably taught that to the ultra Pentecostal people, people who could go low enough. They already are low. A lot of them are not the rich people. They're not the high level, economically, educationally empowered church. They're the low people so they can go low. So I don't know, there may be something to that because if you, if God has blessed you financially, if God has blessed you educationally, if God has given you great position and you can't humble yourself, you might would have been better off not having all that. In the economy of God, talking about for the eternal rewards, for the stuff that nobody can take from you. It is right here. So Peter, now he's a disciple, but he couldn't handle Jesus doing that. And uh, Peter in John 13, 8 says, you should never wash my feet. Jesus answered, said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Look here. Feet represent the wall. Your walk is your lifestyle, behavior, the way you carry yourself, the way your comportment, your attitude, the weight, the substance of your life. That's consecration, all of it, okay? Simon Peter said, said to him in verse nine, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. See, this is a big mouth. Just, just stand down and knock my head. Nope, he doesn't. Jesus said to him, he who is, ba is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Look at that. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So right in the middle of that, foot washing, look what 
the opportunity was. But the deceiver was there and that that had to be dealt with. So then down in verse 12, I got to go. And when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? L let me just give you a metaphor here in this. I mean, I see, in other words, Jesus in this last sacrament, you, do you understand? I call it the missing sacrament, disrobed himself. Adam, when he failed, sewed fig leaves, pulled the fig leaves off the fig tree and put on. In other words, Jesus pictured opening up, vulnerability, transparency. Look, they were naked and not ashamed. Why? No sin. But as soon as Adam and his wife sinned, what happened? They covered up. So in true humility, where you know you're walking in it, is when there's true transparency. And that's what he's demonstrating to them. And then he asked them this like amazing question here in verse 12. You with me? John 13, 12. Hey, this is a kind of a bit to go to work on today, isn't it? <laughs> okay, but it's what it is. You got this to get with the bishop. Okay, watch. Do you not know what I've done to you? Now, that's a critical question right there. Do you not know what, I'm, what I've done to you? In other words, he's saying disciples. In other words, he's saying, I'm doing this because you're, you're to model something out. And this, first of all, you're to model humility. Okay. Two, you ought to know how to go low. Three, you ought to think of somebody other than yourself. Four, you are to put others above you. Now, one of the things about reconciliation is a bridge ministry. That means you uh, you carry somebody someplace they could, you take some, somebody someplace they couldn't get to on their own. That's what a bridge does. You walk on it. Yeah. And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, you call me teacher, verse 13. And Lord, and you say, well, so I am. He said, yeah, exactly. If then, look, if I then, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Did you hear that? I want to show you something. And here I am in a stadium event in, in, uh, here in Atlanta with uh, an event with 40,000 pastors and bishops promise keepers. And I was getting ready to go up there and I realized something about history. That tribal warfare in Africa related to gang warfare in America and the division of even the black community here in this country where instead of us unifying out of a historical context, I believe that also is important. I can't go into that now with the blacks and the Jews that our historical context are so similar to the Jews that blacks should be closer to Jews than what they demonstrate right now. It looks like I'm gonna be going over there this year. Not just to, to preach, I've already been over there that way. I'm talking about to establish something, a beachhead, so over there. And so anyway, I won't go into that. But, and so here we are. Do you know what I've done to you? And then he said, you ought to wash one of those feet. So at that meeting, 40,000, I felt God told me, reconcile what happened in, in, in the tribal warfare, selling their uh, own people to the, look, the slave traders, look, the Arabs, Dutch, Portuguese, English, then the Americans took it to the level it had ever been. And look, so that was broken, slavery, Slave trade, I told it, I told you about it, 1808, and then international slave trade, and then eventually slavery, 1863. But look, but we're not broken. True brokenness is behavioral. Not just an incident, 
but you can use these things like washing feet as a, a signal of a pathway God wants to take you to true humility. So you know what? Tony Evans was there and he was one of the speakers. I was one of the speakers. And again, I was out there, you know, I just never got the fat boys to get behind me, but I'm still out there. God did it. I, that's okay. So you know what God told me to do? Wash his feet. Well, I, I was kind of waffling out of it. I just mentioned it. I want to show you a video that I want you to take a look at and then I'll come back on in a second. You know, I was sitting there, Tony, and I was just thinking about Tony Evans, the powerful message that he gave last night. And I was thinking about, you know, Tony, just, bro, I tell you what I was thinking about. I was thinking about washing your feet. And if I could have some actual water, I would wash your feet right now. This is, this is, this is in the flesh, black on black. Let me tell you something, bro. God is using you, man. Let me tell you something. I, it doesn't matter how much criticism the brothers give you, how much they put you down, how much they miss you. You are a man of God. You are a man of character. God has raised you up in this last hour. You are being used mightily of God. I, I see you too, man. I'm telling you, I see you, bro. I wash your feet. I see you, man. I wash your feet, bro, in this. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to stand with you. You're going to see that in a lot of ways. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your denomination is. It don't make any difference. God has his hands on you. And you see everybody the same. And people love your spirit and love what God is doing to you. See what God is doing to you. And so I want to tell you right now, from this day, I want to seed into you healing the difference between black on blacks. You are a man of God, man, and I love you. And I just want to say that. Bless his holy name. Thank you, bro. Amen. Bless you. Amen. Anyway, so you understand. So I want to see if there was reconciliation between whites and blacks. If I'm going to be true to the character of Christ, I don't want there to be reconciliation between whites and blacks, and then they come over to the black community and find all kind of division going on in the black community. See, I want to be true about this thing. There's some wild brothers here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. You guys are wild. Man. leaders out there right now and the way that God is using you to reach out to touch this nation man I'm telling you something bro if, if I just bless you man and Jesus says he says just as I've washed your feet you ought to wash one another's feet I'm washing your feet bro because I'm seeing you and I'm gonna protect you I ain't gonna let nobody criticize you or put you down I'm not gonna let anybody dog you out and try to say bad things against you you're a man of God. I see it, man. I see it. I believe in you. I believe in you, man. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you, man. I, I mean that. I mean that from my heart, man. I appreciate you, bro. And, uh, and I thank God for you. Keep on. Keep on. Would you? Keep on, man. Bless the Father. Thank you. No greater honor has ever been bestowed upon me than this. And what's especially meaningful is that somebody out of my own community has come and said that what makes what we're about powerful is Jesus Christ. And it rises above black and white and black and black. And if we could ever rise to make Jesus Christ bigger than color, class, and culture, we can be the church and win back our country. God bless you. Thank you.
And it is. As you probably never saw that, didn't know it existed, and you probably didn't know your bishop um, is out there. You you have to, you know, exalt somebody above yourself. You, you just you got to do that. Now I will tell you this: when my wife died here in March, Tony called me up because um, Lois, his wife, had just passed the year before, and. Um, and and he knew exactly what I was going through. So he called me up. And again, we still recommitted ourselves to one another again to, um, you know, just to try to give ourselves to winning the world to Jesus. Now, of course, he has a huge platform, you know, and and I'm still, you know, God doesn't still go by size. He doesn't. He goes by faithfulness. And uh, he's a blessing. I mean, I just want to say that. I, I know quite a bit about him beyond that. I know the, the effect that Tom Skinner had in his life as somebody who helped disciple him before he got to Dallas Theological Seminary and before he got to, uh, became a Swindoll light. Uh, one of the picture shots they showed of him, the person in the background, I think my memory serves me correct. I think I saw him was Swindoll. That's who he modeled his life is after, but his but his foundation is, is 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 Tom Skinner, and he stayed true to it. He preaches the kingdom of God. You saw sort of like Miles Monroe. He's a good man. He's a good man, and that's what it is. You you so no. Let me just start toward my first clothes. Can you imagine me talking about like early clothes? You and I, as far as God is concerned have to learn how to go low. And, you know, I don't know if I didn't obey God with that then. I don't know if I would have ever gotten another opportunity to, to take a step down in a moment. Now, for some pastor there, um, it may have had some kind of effect that marked him. See, in other words, you know, you know, if you don't know how to humble yourself, how can God use you in the way um, that he wants to use you? Because he's not going to exalt you. He's going to exalt Jesus in you. And that's what, that's what makes the difference. So some of the places I've been in the natural and things I've done, countries, et cetera, I didn't make any of it happen. Listen. God could trust me. See that? And to know that I wouldn't go into some of those places and feel like I was somebody like that you can't even get close to. I remember one time I was in Detroit and uh, again, Bishop Jake's um, was a speaker. I was a speaker. Thomas Trask, at that time, he was over the Assembly of God. I was the last speaker. And they were bringing me in. You know how they do. And one of the people who was an usher saw me and they said, Wellington, Wellington Boone. And I said, hey, I turned around and somebody corrected it right away and said, no, no. It's not, that's Bishop Boone. And I looked in her eyes when, when they said that. And um, I knew if I, if I didn't let them take me away, it would have left the wrong mark on that woman that God couldn't have validated. So I let them go ahead to their seat. I said, I'll be there. I'll be okay. And I looked at her. I said, look, I, I got you. I understand. And, you know, you're, not, you're not disrespecting me, but what, uh, what were you dealing with? She said, my husband heard you. Ever since he's heard you, he's been a different man. My marriage is great. My family is great. Thank you so much. I was just so excited to hear you were going to be here. And I got a chance to even talk to you directly. And I'm thinking, look at that. If I would let protocol get in the way of somebody that was just being testimonial, wouldn't that have been missing it big time there over titles. Mm -mm. Listen, you got to find humility. 
You got to, you know, if you don't find anything else, um, I'm telling you, turn to Isaiah 57. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that. I'm going ahead of you, but you get anything out of this? So, you know what was important for me this week? Is I didn't just talk to you about principles, but let you see how God let me walk. And that's just how it's happened. Again, I want to emphasize, I didn't make any of it happen. Didn't strategically plan it. Didn't um, position myself to be in those places. God did. And I just want to thank him a thousand times for letting me do it. Look what it says in Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one, would have its eternity. Now, you know where I'm at in this. I still need to come over there and talk about eternity more. But this is where you live from and you live in. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. But you got it, and I got to know more about the world we're going to be in forever. Right? What do you think? We're just going to get zapped? Got to grow in it. I got to grow in it. I, and... I want more, okay? I want to say I am growing in it, but I need more. It says, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. There you go. That's the consecration. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Did you see, did you see this? Why would God be with somebody who has a contrite and humble spirit? Because that's where he's at. Right? You know, where are you coming from? You see that? In other words, hey, what's up? Where are you at? That's where he's at. And as long as you are there, he'll always be with you there. He's not going to be with you in your pride. He's not going to be with you in your selfishness. He's not going to be with you in contention and strife. Mm -mm. He's going to be with you with contriteness. That means you're self-governing. You you don't understand meaning that you're going to get yourself in line with God and you're going to defer to another man's estate, meaning that as long as you don't violate a principle, you're going to try to make sure somebody else is promoted above yourself. I did have a one of the people I knew. He would say, look, God gave me power to get well, but I make sure my church and the pastor's business is taken care of. Because God gave me power to get wealth to establish my covenant in the earth. I'm here in this church and no better place I can give than so into the church. I'm not just giving to the church and the man, I'm giving to the cause of God. I'm in a church whose cause I believe in, so I sow to it significantly. I don't just give the tithes and offerings. I don't just give special offerings. I got, look, I'm like, the, the money that was available in the Joash chest. I had this friend of mine whose house I lived in in Phoenix, Arizona. He's, he owns, I'll tell you right now, he owns Swiss America. You see that? He owns a gold company. And I used to go there, again, this is one of those situations where uh, he had something called a prophet's chamber for me. He did. Daughters and all of them, I haven't seen him in quite a while now. It's been a few years. I think it, my wife was living the last time I saw him. So I went to church with him at Phoenix First in Phoenix on Wednesday night. And I see him take out this check and he put it in his chest. I said, like the tithes and offering thing came around and he put something in that. And then he walked up to the front and put something in the Joash chest. I said, what do you do that for? What's that? He said, no. I want to make sure that the projects that the pastor is thinking about doing has the money in it before it's time for the project. I said, what? I said, well, how much was this one? He said, that was, was 25,000 I put in this one. So I'm there 40 days because I'm doing one of my fast consecration times. Okay. So the next week, it's 50,000. Is it 50,000? He said, yeah, it's 50,000. He says, because God was good this week. <laughs> so his seed was aligned up with God's goodness. 
And he was a difference maker in the church. Now, he is so affluent. The last time I talked with him, his two daughters didn't even want to run his gold company. One of them was married. I saw their grandchild. The other was not. They didn't want to do that. Clearly knowing they were already taken care of. This guy wept over the opportunity to give toward the work of God. He was broken. And eventually, that became one of the places that I would go there. I've done fundraisers at Phoenix First. And now, and I don't know if you've heard of the Dream Center. That's Tommy's other son, Matt. All of these places like that. Now, even though Tommy had all of that, you know, the pastor of that church, and um, but yet he had a heart for the lowly. He stayed broken. He didn't just, out of his position, retrograde and look down on people. He carried himself with a humility that would overtake you. You're amazed. Sure, I mean, like some of the churches I've seen with 1,500 people, they think like you can't even touch the pastor. The man at the largest church in the assembly of God. He shake hands, kiss babies and pet puppies, everybody that could get to him. Sure, he knew protocol. He's, a, he's one of the top three in the AG. You got to practice contriteness and humility. The opportunity for people that maybe not be where you are is your opportunity to demonstrate Christ. Let me finish now. No more. No more questions. Okay, here we go. To revive the heart. I'm reading verse 15 now. Look. To revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the heart of the contrite ones. I, I want to read more, but I got to stop there. If you will walk in humility and contriteness, you'll never be without personal revival for the remainder of your life. Revival does not come from self-exaltation. Revival comes from humiliation. See? That's why these, like, like Zeus Street there and Daddy Seymour. I mean, look, man, um, he couldn't even stay in the prayer meeting in Wichita, Kansas, because the, the white person that was leading the prayer meeting teaching on uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he had to sit outside in the hallway. But he didn't let that offend him. He learned what he needed from the hallway and then took the spirit of humility and conflict resolution to L.A. and God used it because he didn't have that spirit of vindictiveness. He stayed humble. Okay, so here's my lesson. Don't follow the pathway of the contemporary conversations critical race theory, Black Lives Matter. I, I know you may not all be black, and plus, whoever may get this know that. It's not the point. The point I'm making is, God is the only one that can assign your value. Anyone that devalues you, they're wrong, and God ain't with them. Why should you listen to nonsense? Your value is the fact that God not only brought you into this world, you are the history that God's creating for the future. Now watch, maybe yours won't be in books. Now I got like hundreds of books, okay? I don't know who's gonna ever see those. Whatever's left in this life isn't just for this life. It's for forever. That's why I try to stay on the side of eternity where the God says, I needed to make this known for generations future because you lived something out. Not only did you learn something, you lived something. That's true for each of you listening to me right now. What you learn and live will go on beyond you. You are the new future of the world because God makes your life influential. Even whether you think so or not, you are influential. See, that's stuff hidden for you. I gotta, I gotta share with you some more about that tomorrow. You are history. I'm not talking about past history. What's going to happen in the future, what God's doing in your life is so critical.
Father, I want you to look at every person under the sound of my voice now. Thank you for them. Thank you for their hearts for you. Thank you for their love for you. Thank you for their day. Bless them. Bless them for the rest of this week. Thank you for the church and what you're doing in their lives. Thank you, Father, for all the people that says, I'm not living this. I'm not, I haven't gone that low. I have fought for my race. I fought for my gender. I fought, and while I should have fought for being Christ-like, thank you for hearing my prayer, and thank you for get, touching their heart. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless. See you tomorrow. Hey, only got one more day, and I'm feeling better, getting warmed up here now. Bye-bye.